today we're going to really focus on chapter four. Hopefully folks had a chance to read or review that. And um, I wanted to start with this passage from chapter four and maybe see if one of you would be willing to read it instead of me. Our guiding principle for chapter four is seek root causes over quick fixes. To embody this principle, we have to learn to slow down and engage in deep listening. By inverting our dominant approach to data and listening to the voices, narratives, and perspectives at the margins, we begin to humanize the process of data gathering. This is a key point because in a street data framework, the ends do not justify the means. Our approaches to data collection are just as important as any insight, understanding, or actions that emerge. Listening deeply and responsively will help us build relational capital and trust and shift the culture as we gather data. We're gonna pause there and that was beautifully read, Lindy, thank you so much. I think just to summarize this passage, the, the process or the process as you might say in BC is just as important as the product, right? That we're really slowing down today to think about not just sort of um, this goal of gathering the data and what are we gonna do with the data, but how does it feel to be in relationship differently with our students or with our colleagues, right? What does it look like to listen in a really embodied and present and mindful way? Um, what, what comes out, what kind of like um, experiential shifts and relational shifts emerge when we kind of change our ways of being with young people and with each other? Um, so that's, the, that's kind of the gestalt of today, of our time together. And we have a couple of intentions. Um, we're going to reset our agreements based on sort of what we observed from the first session. I'll have I'll invite Jamila to share a little bit of our reflections from session one. We're going to dig back into those epistemology maps, the homework assignment, and kind of in circle, explore and share a little bit around our own ways of knowing and being, which are always either tacitly or explicitly kind of affecting how we show up. Um, and then we want to give you just like a balcony view of the equity transformation cycle, <clears throat> an, an example actually from Abbotsford in British Columbia, and then end with um, zooming in on the listen piece of the cycle and asking you in your teams to think about, you know, who do we need to listen to given our equity challenge, um, what strategies or approaches are we going to tap into from the book, and, and then how do we need to show up in those interactions. Um, and then let me turn it to you for this piece. Yes, so we introduced these last time, the agreements. I wanted to bring them back to us, share some reflections and then have us think about them again. Um, just glancing at them really quickly. Um, obviously we are all here to learn together. So um, no one knows everything together. We know a lot, please bring your knowledge and make space for others. Um, this is a crazy, crazy time and lots of is, is going on in the world and yet we are educators and so we have to kind of live in an abundance mindset when we're thinking about kids at all times. Um, of course, in this group, which I'll talk a little bit about, assume pro in a second, assume positive intent, but think about your impact. We may say something on accident, that's okay, but really focus on the impact you have on other people. Um, we can't be articulate all the time. I had a typo in a presentation yesterday and I was like, but 99% of it was right. So like, don't judge me, same thing here. Um, you know, you might say it how you want meant to say, it. you might not, that's all good, bring your full self. And then finally, um, center the margins and be changed by those folks. And when you see our examples, we try to do that a lot. Let me go to these reflections and then I'm gonna come back to these agreements. I love agreements. The hardest thing about them though, sometimes they don't get used. In this space, I feel like they're starting to be used and I wanna create Shane um, and Jennifer, I wanna create the space where we really lean into those. And what I've appreciated, what we noticed last time is that you were all really eager and willing to share. I really felt like the no one knows everything was coming alive in the space. That was so great to hear from two such different teams. Um, and I felt like people were just okay with sharing where they, where they are. And so I wouldn't necessarily call it not being articulate all the time, but I felt like people were willing to share wherever they were in the space and time. And we really noticed that and really feel appreciative of that. And as always, we are coaches. And so I have two pushes for us. Okay. Um, we were so, and are so inspired by, by you all's um, commitment to transforming. And when we first started, we brought up some behaviors around white supremacy culture. You all remember that? It's on your first agenda. And one of the things we noticed is that we have these really big dreams, but we were falling into those, in, into some spaces. 
into some either or thinking, right? About what's possible. Either we can do it this way or we can do it this way, right? And so what I wanted to call in is just this ask for you all to really be able to say, hey, I'm noticing that we're falling into this or that, right? I'm noticing that, you know, we may have been articulating that um, our goal is to completely do this differently, but that kind of sounds like the thing we've always done before. I think I really want you all to feel comfortable with um, pushing each other in that way, because first of all, we don't have a lot of time and you all opted into this. So you kind of get to get as messy as you want. There's no, like, you're not going to get in trouble. So please really, really do that in the space, especially across teams. Um, and I think in that the agreement, it makes me think about is the assume positive intent, but think about impact because we all have intentions to do right by kids, but the impact of like going into that white supremacy thinking, right. Can be negative on some folks. And so I wanted to just bring that to the surface for you all. And then my second push is for you to stay in the place of what we like to call radical dreaming, but that's like kind of related to abundance mindset. When we are in this space, we really believe in the tool and the power of listening at the margins. And we're gonna get into that. And when you all go back to your spaces and places, I really want you to think big about how you might engage in things like listening with the kids you will um, decide to focus on. So those are our reflections from last time. Wanna just give a little bit of push and invite you all to step into your full power and want you all to just look at these agreements again, now that I shared that and just set an intention for yourself. Where do you really wanna lean in? And even though I don't have them up, the white supremacy culture behaviors, if there's one that you remember that feels important for you to just have top of mind for you, that's great too. Or maybe Shane, they just like had those behaviors like every day since then. And they're like, I don't even need to look at the paper because I've been using it every, all the time. And I know exactly um, what I've been focusing on. Anyway, just kidding. Shane, we're going to get into epistemology. You want to kind of frame that up for us? So um, we shared this last time, and then Jamila, I think, sent our examples of epistemology maps to y'all. And we're going to give you another kind of four or five minutes today to regroup if you got started on it, to look back at it, to think about which parts of that, those stories you want to tell, because you don't necessarily need to say it all. Um, and you know, the idea here is that we all have sort of implicit ways of knowing and being in the world and in our work. And that part, a, a really important piece of becoming equity-centered educators is becoming more aware, bringing what's implicit into our conscious awareness. Um, they say that like 2% of our emotional cognition is conscious, 98% of it lives below the iceberg waterline, if we took the iceberg metaphor, and is like totally unconscious. So the idea with this exercise is to is to think about some of the stories and experiences and core memories we've had that have shaped how we show up in the world. And to do that by looking through this prism of um, agency, our identity, our sense of belonging, our experiences around mastery, um, and then finally efficacy. We'll be coming back to that in the next session as well. So we thought it was only fair to um, make ourselves a little bit vulnerable and share our epistemology maps with you all and then give you a few minutes to kind of look at your own. And then we're going to end up moving into two circles to share and they will be um, cross team circles this time. So you'll get to share with a couple of people that you maybe don't know as well. So Jamil and I are going to do three minutes timed each to try to share uh, some of our stories. JD, you're on. Got my three minute timer going. And within my three minutes, I'm just going to say I love the epistemology map because it really helps me think about how I'm showing up and why I show up the way that I do. I'm going to pick just a few pieces from each bucket. I'm going to start with identity, which I've been thinking about a lot. And I'm going to pull on the first two, which say we are an African people from Kwanzaa, ancestral celebrations, wearing African garb, all of us. And then this piece around juxtaposed with your pretty for a dark skinned girl. In my identity, being a Black person and a person of African descent, even though I'm African American, has been huge in my family. Like there is not a year that I can think of where we did not think about how important it was to acknowledge our ancestors and our roots. And so when I think about my identity, I realize like I find it like 
interesting or sometimes strange when people don't think about that so much because that's been a huge part of my life. And I also think about identity and how I've had this upbringing, but also the fact that when I was growing up, I didn't necessarily feel affirmed in my identity all at the same time in the external world. Um, and I remember like, I cared about boys so much <laughs> and they would say like, you're really pretty for a dark skinned girl and how just that piece of identity, it's like you, you need so much affirmation around it um, because some places you might get the affirmation and some you might not. In belonging, I will pull on the second one that says Miss Puckett and Miss, Miss Diamora projects and connection. I, I can literally, I know so much about the religion of Islam because of a project I did in the seventh grade where we were assigned different religions to learn about and we all could do it in different ways. And I just felt like I belonged in that space because I was pretty form, a free form thinker and they just let me go where I needed to go. Um, and I do have to say Baba Tabidi just in my um, Afrocentric school, he just always told me I was amazing and important. So those are places I felt belong, belonging and they shape how I think about instruction um, and other people. For mastery, um, I still have a, a book I wrote in third grade from Mr. Venable's class um, during writing and we did the writer's workshop process and the, the process of iteration, iteration, iteration and feedback, feedback, feedback are just so important to me, really um, helped me see that I could do great things. And um, I would almost tie that to belonging as well because I felt like Mr. Venable was very strict but I always felt like I belonged in his classroom and I really, really thrived. And I just think about what's possible with like feedback and revision, feedback and revision. And then for efficacy, um, the, the belief that I can do stuff, I think I've learned that in my life, it's been a lot about like resisting status quo, but then building upon. So I feel like I've had a lot of practice with resisting, but then being like, well, here's how you do it differently. And I feel like my teachers and people who have been in my life have helped me have both of those so that I balance like, rage and radical dreaming at the same time. I feel like I'm really great at that. So that's my epistemology map and it really shapes how I'm showing up with you all right now and how I show up when I'm working as an educator. Thank you, Jamila. Let's give her some snaps or emoji love, just a little support. Uh, it's amazing even having done this before together, there's just always vulnerability, right? And sharing your story. So really appreciate you. Um, and so I'm gonna put my timer on as well. I haven't really talked about this for a while. So it's interesting to look at it today when so much has shifted in my world. And I think just like a meta frame first is, you know, I grew up, if you've read chapter one of the book, you know, in a in kind of a suburb, like a typical white, predominantly white middle class suburb. I went to public schools that were, you know, like well, good performing, high performing on satellite data, but very oppressive and very hierarchical places. And I've had the privilege to walk, you know, through the world since that growing up experience in, in really different ways that have challenged my ways of being and expanded and shifted my epistemologies. And um, some of those are on here. I think from the identity side, what was really most formative for me was working in the youth prison system um, in Rhode Island, where I went to college. And this kind of really stark understanding of systemic racism, having grown up with a lot of white middle class boys who did all kinds of criminal things and never ended up in the system. And it wasn't until I walked through, you know, a youth prison that was predominantly, you know, black and brown youth that I was like, oh, this is this is exactly how it's built. It's built for kids to like not be incarcerated and kids who do the same thing who are black or Southeast Asian or Latinx in that context to be um, to be locked up. And that really fueled for me like an early moral imperative that actually brought me into education because I originally wanted to be an attorney, a, a juvenile defender. So that was very, very formative. I think going backwards in time to um, middle school or sixth, seventh and eighth grade, um, I was in a family that had a very, um, there was just a lot of trauma <laughs> and a very toxic divorce and a lot of like adverse childhood experiences happening. And I had like one teacher, you know, people talk about their memory networks around the one teacher, like one teacher, sixth grade teacher, Mrs. Lee, who just really saw me and wasn't only a great teacher curricularly, which she was, I still remember things we did, but like took me out to ice cream and just asked me how I was, like knew my parents were splitting up and just sat with me and was like, how are you, you know? And I still remember that so vividly, like every detail of that moment I can remember. 
Um, and it just stayed with me, the power of relationships and connection and, and being listened to, right? I think on the mastery side, like I was a high performing student and the thing that things that most mattered to me, and I'll tell this quickly and then stop, were actually not in the classroom. They were, you know, doing activism around AIDS. This is, I went to high school in the late 80s. So it was like early AIDS activism. It was um, doing this performance. You know, I wasn't a drama kid, but I performed this monologue about suicide, which had been part of like my experience growing up and um, with family members. And these things were so meaningful to me, but there were no grades attached. There was no like academic value attached. So that really, I think has shaped to me that like the grades and the metrics and the things are really not always what matters in a child's experience. Um, and I think that I'll pause there because I don't want to take more time. So that's a little bit about us. Um, you all have your own stories and layers of ways of being and knowing um, in the world that come from, from your own experiences. And so hopefully you've had a chance to think about this, but I'm going to, um, Put on a five minute timer you can turn your camera off if you want and just kind of regroup and think about in in three minutes what do i want to share from this right what what feels important to me as i express who i am as an educator and then we'll move into breakout rooms here we go so the piece of the map that kind of stuck out most to me that like i saw myself in and i noticed that i see my students in is the mastery corner, I guess. And so for me, um, my accomplishments in life are kind of those that are valued by the people that I surround myself with. And it's almost like an expectation. So I never really felt like I had mas have mastered anything really, because it's just like, well, you're supposed to get a degree or buy a house or whatever those like life um what do you call them the milestones are so that was interesting to like really dig into that and think about when I look at my students and those who are struggling and get all of the extra support in the back of my mind I'm always thinking about those who don't seem to like need support but knowing that coming from that side myself like they do need support and they can be pushed farther and they they want that attention and need it just as much as anyone else. So that's something that has always been like underlying in the way that I teach. So it was cool to kind of pinpoint the reason for that, I guess. For efficacy, I'm not sure if it was in this group, but in speaking about this book, um, Elise, our administrator mentioned paralysis by analysis is something that her husband suffers from and that's me as well a hundred percent so with efficacy it's like when I am sure I don't have that paralysis by analysis then I know like that is a path that I was meant to follow and I'm confident following so it's kind of nice to know that if I don't have that feeling like I can move forward very sure-footedly and then belonging it kind of fits into that mastery piece like I wrote in my corner always question mark like I've never felt that I haven't belonged and I know that's a huge privilege um and maybe that's not how everyone else around me has seen it but I've just kind of experienced life through rose colored glasses and I feel very lucky for that so um I think that's what shapes me as a teacher, like always going towards those kiddos who might feel like, yeah, I got it. I'm like just going through the motions and really making them feel like, you know what, we can do more. I see you and like, let's push you even further. So I, I am just gonna kind of go through all four corners. Um, so for identity, I grew up in the Mission District of San Francisco, which is also where our school is located, right in the mission. And um, the mission is a predominantly, especially back in the 80s, predominantly uh, Latinx neighborhood. And so playing out on the street, I, I always knew that I looked very different from all of the people around me, you know, I like as a, a white person, we were the only white family on the block. Um, so I was very aware of like, race at, from early on, but um, 
but I didn't really understand my privilege until um, a, a lot later. So um, I think also that's just where I, I wanted to learn how to speak Spanish just to be able to communicate with my friends because a lot of times they would shift into Spanish and I'd be like, okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, but um, yeah, I was very privileged to have done some work with Glenn Singleton where I really was able to understand my privilege. But unfortunately that wasn't until a lot later in my life. So um, around college. Um, so that's my identity, belonging. I, I think the times that I most belong, felt like I belonged in school um, was definitely around moments of SEL time. Like we, at my school, we had what was called magic circle and we would be in small groups and we were able to like talk about, you know, I, like a, how we were feeling about certain things. So that was a really important structure that I really, um, yeah, I um, really valued in my school. Um, for mastery, it, it's hard because I, I do have this, you know, the white perfectionism thing. It's still in me right now. Um, but I, I never really felt like I mastered anything until someone told me that I did. Um, so that's just something that I think I, I still struggle with, um, even to this, to this day. Um, and, um, I think that for efficacy, um, I, the thing that really stuck out to me the most was, um, being all of the schools that I went to had a, um, we had to do some sort of community service. So like being outside of just our community. So I, I volunteered in many different ways growing up. And that really was where I felt like I was the most, um, yeah, I was doing the most work for the community. Um, so I'll start with identity. And um, I kind of created this based on the prompts. And so when I was looking at kind of constructing this, I just like, I thought of a, a memory of exactly when um, I, I was more aware of my privilege and of my race in grade five. Um, my, I'm so fortunate to be from um, a family. I have one brother and two parents um, who remain together and very happy. And I've just always been very supported from my family in that way and um, very loving community. And um, so we we're very fortunate to always have family dinners um, together at at um, at night and debrief about our days and um, enjoy each other's company that way. And um, I just remember this one time when I was kind of frustrated with another student, and um, you know, she she had said something about um, being Métis, and it, I wasn't frustrated because she was Métis, but she had she would be picking on my friends or whatever, and I was just like, "There's something like you're not being kind," and I kind of like responded, and that like, "What do you mean you're Métis? You look normal." And so that when I said that at the table, like my older brother, who's only two years older than me, he was just like. <gasps> And my parents, they were just like, what do you mean? And so like, that was the first time when I just like felt that shame of just like, you don't know, like, you don't know what everybody's story is, like what is normal to you, like there is no normal. And so as she, you know, had blonde hair and blue eyes to me, I, I assumed that she was just like me in Caucasian and, and descent. Um, and so that was kind of when I really realized my privilege, um, just being in that. Um, so just to acknowledge that um, part that kind of carried on with me, just like, I guess that um, that heaviness of feeling that I didn't, I didn't know those things. So that is a huge thing that moved forward um, into becoming an educator because like I, wanted to be able to uplift students and uplift others. Um, and so I went on um, into high school and I remember being in a social justice class and we learned about all sorts of things um, and, you know, racial issues and, you know, human rights issues. And I remember um, being really upset 
with the teacher because we didn't have any Indigenous issues. And this was maybe eight, 10 years ago when it was being, it was really being discussed in Canada. And so um, I was really upset with this teacher and saying, hey, like, why aren't we discussing these issues? And I did my final, my final project, my final project on, um, you know, the, the consistently minority and just like um, how we're always leaving this topic out um, in our education. So um, that was, that's been a huge thing that has led me into my education. Um, Shane, I connect with you about um, wanting to go into law as well, but finding this path, um, wanting to support Indigenous students. Um, so for me, um, I, the first time I understood race was when I moved to the, to the United States because in Mexico, everybody looked like, like me, everybody was Mexican. So it wasn't until I came to the United States where I'm like, wow, like people are so different. Um, there's just different races. Um, but it wasn't until high school when um, I felt that I understood uh, or I better understood my racial identity um, because in elementary school, I would visit Mexico City a lot. And then I stopped when I was in middle school and high school. Um, and then in high school, I went back and then I was just kind of like struck because I felt that I kind of didn't belong there anymore. But then I also felt like I didn't belong in the American culture either. So it, it was just difficult. Like I felt like I was in between. So um, just like reflecting and understanding that it's okay to be a little bit of both um, and to feel connections to, to both um, Mexico and then my new life now in the, in the United States. Um, and I think I, I didn't understand my privilege until I started working at BVHM with our community. Because even though I am Latinx, um, I did come to the States with, um, I was documented, I had papers. Um, it, I didn't have to go through all the hardships that a lot of our students um, have to go through. Oh, sorry, <laughs> didn't get here. Um, and, Belonging, sorry, um, I think about high school and um, I had a teacher in high school who was um, concerned about my grades and how I had um, just stopped participating as much in class. And um, he like had uh, like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, like what's going on? You know, I've noticed um, some changes so I think that sense of belonging to me comes from having, yeah, one-to-one -one conversations with others. Um, and mastery, um, sadly, I feel that my vision of mastery is, has been influenced by white supremacy thinking and the Western thinking. So it is, um, yeah, um, and influenced by what my family thinks. So it's like, yeah, getting your degree. Um, getting like national board certified. Um, so I have to work on that and trying to think like, where else do I see mastery in my life? Efficacy, um, I uh, recall a moment when I took action. Um, I think like with my students, especially, um, yeah, um, as a special ed teacher, now as a general ed teacher, when it's like, oh, I feel like this student needs more support and pushing for that, advocating for them. Um, and it is difficult for me to fight sometimes and go against others. I just wanna thank you and also like say to you that you don't ever have to apologize for your emotions in this space. It's, it's all welcome here. All of you is welcome. All the feelings that are very real and, you know, legitimate. So thank you. Can I share my thing so it's more visual? I think so. Tell me if it works. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> Is it working? Yeah. Okay. So a little, a little bit of context on my identity. I was born and raised in in Spain, in Sevilla, in southern Spain. Uh, um, my family was just middle class family. 
and they they put a lot of emphasis on education. So my two sister and I went to college. I got a, a master degree, I mean, um, a degree in architecture. Um, and that was something that, uh, well, it gave me a sense of superiority, you know, like, because it was, it took me many, many years um, to accomplish that. And I was very proud of that, and I still am. Uh, but then later on in life, um, I came to the United States. My, my wife is from here, from San Francisco. And I went to the University of San Francisco to get my master in credential uh, dual program. And I took there uh, teaching for diversity and social justice first. And that changed totally my my perspective, you know, who I was, um, where I came from. It was really, really uh, sometimes a little painful uh, realization of, you know, what, uh, you know, the, my reality. Um, so I, mm, so the, I'm going to just rush between the long and mastery. Uh, when I was in Spain, I had a really, really nice a teacher who was also um, an architect. Uh, and he also hired me I mean, in, because he has his own office. And I was, so I had, you know, I was ha uh, very happy to learn a lot of him. And mostly, you know, developing grades and professional commitment. And that's what I tried to go, you know, to convey, um, give to my student as much as I can. Uh, I try to be a one demand, demander with my student as he was with me, uh, especially for those marginalized students. Um, and it's, it's, I'm saying here in my efficacy that it was it's, it's sometimes painful because it required a lot of trust um, all the time, high expectations, and that is, you know, is has ups and downs. Um, I'm going to stop here. Yeah, because that's my time. And thank you for listening. So I grew up in Wisconsin, um, outside of Milwaukee. So I, my identity, I always felt like an outsider. I always could, like as a small kid, I always felt like I didn't quite belong. My family moved from Guatemala to Wisconsin when I was around five. Um, I'm gonna, yeah. Um, so, but, um. But I also feel like that was a privilege for me. Like I felt really connected to my Guatemalan community and identity. And I would spend my summers with my family in Guatemala. So I always felt like I had like one foot in one country and one foot in the other. Um, but uh, I feel like, and then my family also really valued education. Um, my great, my, my grandpa was the first in our family to go get a professional degree in Guatemala. He was one of the first, um, he was a doctor there and then my dad followed in his footsteps and then I was supposed to be the other, the like as the oldest daughter, like the the doctor of the family. Um but I didn't quite <laughs> make it <laughs> and said fell into teaching. Um but because of that belong in to connect to belonging, I always felt really at home at school, um, even though I felt kind of like an outsider. Um I really enjoyed studying, reading, I was like a total nerd. Um I really that sense of belonging in school just increased as I progressed through like in college I really enjoyed getting to know get, being able to explore my own courses not being bogged down by requirements and then in grad school dedicating myself like wholeheartedly to uh, my professional education as a teacher um, and then where I one area where I did feel mastery as a as a young person was in learning French uh, my seventh grade French teacher kind of saw, took me aside and like gave me actually extra French lessons. And because of her, I was inspired to learn more. Um, and there I followed the very traditional kind of like Western culture sense of mastery. I got my degree in French literature um, in college. Um, but since then, to connect to efficacy, um, where I feel really where I want to make change is I'm really passionate about literacy. And I'm really passionate about social justice. And so 
whenever I'm in the classroom or when I'm with students, what I hope for them is through their knowledge of history, of being able to think critically about text, that I can encourage them to be activists, to reflect and analyze um, their position in society, um, and just kind of allow them to have that critical lens on our world to then hopefully inspire them to enact positive change in their community. At that time in my life, uh, I suddenly found myself as a very traditional corporate wife with an MBA. And, um, you know, I did leave that life because it just didn't fit. That's not how my life was supposed to be. Um, and then, you know, when we were tasked last year or two years ago with be an anti-racist teacher, it was like, well, how are we supposed to do that? Because that's just sort of San Francisco Unified just sort of threw that at us. So I started taking classes and, and you know, I took a lot of, uh, did a lot of work through the Episcopal Church, Sacred Ground. And then just last week, there was a seminar on teaching children about racism. And, um, you know, that, that goes to just to the efficacy, which, you know, I left that life that didn't fit. Um, and it's, it's painful, horribly painful and difficult for me to study race and looking at I'm reading it, it's over here. How I have perpetuated systemic racism out of my ignorance. You know, it's just um, like, I wanted to leave last week this seminar and it, it was like, when you're not comfortable anymore, I can't go back to my little white world anymore because that's not comfortable either, you know? So it's like, I know that I'm walking towards and I'm growing and changing, but you know, it. it's always been difficult for me to look at what people with my skin color have done, but then looking at myself and, and you know, that ignorance. Um, mastery for me was always through the arts. You know, I was very active, solo at ballet, soloist. And then I have since had um, 10 knee operations. I'm old <laughs> and started doing costuming and then did a lot of arts integration training with the Kennedy Center in Washington, DC. So, you know, very fortunate all the way through. Um, and the belonging part. The belonging part was, you know, early, they hit kids when I started school. Mm -hmm. and, and so finally mid-year move in second grade to a happy, funny teacher rather than those scary ones with the giant paddles because that, that didn't happen in my household. Um, and a fifth grade and sixth grade teacher who I had the same teacher who really got me with the drama and everything. And, and you know, my parents are educators. And so just growing into that, it took a while. It took a while because I, I married someone who was working for Ralph Nader and then went over to corporate. Uh, and so that was very weird. And, and then I got a very traditional, because in the 80s, everybody was either going to law school or MBA school. And, and you know, just all of a sudden you wake up and your life is like, this is not my life. I don't want this life. So then you have to go through that transformation and I'm still going through it. So thank you for listening. Identity. I would say um, I live in Canada, but I grew up um, just outside of Seattle in, in Washington state. So um, to me, kind of saying I'm American means so much more now living in, in Canada because kind of the stereotypes or like what, what American means is maybe more obvious to me now that I don't live there than, than, when, I, than when I did live there. Um, I grew up in a very hardworking blue collar family that, you know, we went to church on Sunday and that was a, a really important part of our uh, experience. Um, and so kind of when I say American, it's a little, I feel like it's kind of, I was a cheerleader in high school, like a very stereotypical um, white American. Um, but then also when I think about my identity, I think about at this stage, um, being a mom, I think is probably a big part of my identity and how that has kind of shifted things. And then also, and I'm just gonna speak to this, it's, it's, it's just part of my story, um, but through three and a half, moving closer to four years ago, now my husband very suddenly passed away. And so I'm only sharing that because that was a real shift in, well, a lot of things, um, but my identity and there's, kind of some other things that I come back to that. So um, 
Yeah, belonging. I would say um, when we talk about teachers, I think we all have that because it's a question as educators that we get so often, who's the teacher? For, for me, it was Mr. Clark. He was my high school drama teacher. Um, and he just did the most, he showed inclusion in the most authentic way. Like all of his students in all of his classes had nicknames. He knew like who was dating who and how to kind of, um, just little pieces of everyone's life across the board. And everyone felt like we were his favorite. And so I always think about him and in terms of an excellent example of a teacher and inclusion, but also he just made everyone feel like they belonged. And when we were in those classes, we were friends with every single person in the class. It was really cool. Mastery, I think just being an educator, I started as a CEA, which you guys call in Paris, but started as a CEA and then was a teacher and then now I'm a vice principal. And I certainly wouldn't say that I have education mastered, but it's a part of who I am and, and continue to seek striving for that. And then efficacy, just two things I want to say quickly. Oh yeah, there's me. Um, I think really understanding my privilege in a new way and um, kind of wrestling with a lot of the things in my privilege I was born with. And so um, I don't want to feel bad about that. And I also want to use my voice because I have privilege. So I would say efficacy that way. And then the last thing really quickly is just trauma. My husband dying really suddenly was a traumatic experience. And I also know that it's just a little tiny bit compared to a lot of what our students are experiencing. And I know for me how that felt that I couldn't focus, I couldn't do all the things for a while. And um, how I just have a deeper understanding of what that looks like. And I think a lot of our students are dealing with significant trauma every day, not in just like an isolated incident. So that's me. So in terms of my identity and my belonging, I think that they are actually very connected. Um, some of the prompts on the screen, I didn't really feel like they fit and there was something wrong. Um, I don't actually have really any good memories of school. Um, I grew up in a really small town and my, my parents were both teachers in the high school. And I kind of felt like all my teachers were my parents' friends. And um, there was something with that. And all I can think about was wanting to escape. And so when I talk about identity and belonging, I don't actually feel like I came into any of that until I left. And I started university and um, I, I think I gained a greater sense of belonging there. Um, there were some really good relationships that I had um, and they kind of kept me through and the whole time. So my belonging and identity don't, I feel like really start until I actually kind of moved to Kelowna where I am now. Um, in terms of mastery, that is also kind of linked, I think to my belonging and the fact that um, I am a learner all the time and probably that is the most important thing to me. Um, if I didn't have to work, <laughs> I would just go to school. And so like to complete a, a bachelor's degree and then a master's and now I've started my doctorate. Um, that's kind of where I find mastery and belonging. Like it's the space I am most happy in. Um, I think that uh, my mastery is also in that space because I struggle with a few things. Um, I'm neurodiverse and I also have um, some pretty significant mental health challenges. And so just to be able to function the way that I'm functioning right now, um, I think people would be surprised to recognize what, you know, I kind of go through and overcome to be able to, to get to those places. Um, and then efficacy, I think definitely is going to be a start for me. Um, I recognize my privilege through one of my classes last summer. 
uh, we had to do this exercise where we were writing about our identity in terms of um, white privilege or race or whatever. And I was really introspective of that. And it just allowed me to recognize where I'm at and kind of what I want to do moving forward and what I want my actual research to be. So it's really guided me that way. Thank you. Okay, so efficacy. No, I'm going to start with identity. Sorry. I grew up in a middle class home. Um, my mom is strong Italian family and my parents immigrated here from Italy. And so culture has always been rooted quite deeply in me. When we've got family reunions, there are 350 of us that get together. So we are your typical big Italian family with great food. Um, and growing up, I started dancing at three years old. And also at three years old, I had my first panic attack um, in the home. And so I've been dealing with panic disorder and anxiety since the age of three. And at 15, it showed up on an EEG that I was actually having some seizure activity to go along with that. So they were intense panic attacks that were also showing as seizure. Um, so I've been dealing with that. And I feel like I have spent a lot of my life in fight or flight because of that. And so when I see some of our students that are showing up in fight or flight, I can really connect with that. And I think that that lends a hand to my mastery in relationship building with some of those kiddos. Um, De-escalating, using some tools, just building the connections, the relationship piece before we can even introduce the academics. But I'm the arts teacher. And so in the drama space, there's so much opportunity for escapism and um, experiencing their school life without it having to be rote memory or anything like that. And I, I really appreciate having the space to allow people to take risks and feel brave and really build that community together. Um, efficacy, I've always believed in social justice. I ran the Me to We program at our school before that went wayside in, Canada, in Canadian schools here. And we had a trip booked to Kenya this last spring break, which of course also fell through because of COVID. Um, but it was something that was not supported by the district. So it was, I had to do it outside of the school through the community. And that was always interesting to me because there were roadblocks that were political or, you know, because of insurance purposes or legalities, but it was important work. And the students really wanted to do some you know, global work and get over there and be feet on the ground. And we navigated through that and we built a community team that of 10 kids that were headed over to Kenya. And unfortunately, because of COVID, it fell through. But yeah, I kind of, that's it. I don't know. I got 15 seconds left. I'll just do jazz hands until the end. <laughs> so I took the questions literally and I just went through and answered the question. So I, I, I might ad lib, I might kind of rock and roll, but it kind of struck me that have I ever really had to um, acknowledge my own racial identity before this process? And I genuinely don't think I have. Um, and I definitely fall in the category of have I taken my the skin I'm in for granted? And I would definitely say that. So um, I was raised um, in, and I guess we'll call it like an agricultural family because my parents are farmers. So I was raised on a farm with horses and I did 4-H. So a lot of what I identify with is that kind of hardworking individual, but my parents valued education because I'm the first and only one in my family to uh, finish and do post-secondary. So um, my dad didn't graduate. So there was such a huge push for me to make something of myself and to get the education that um, my parents did not. Um, and so I definitely think my sense of belonging came through education and came through schooling. Um, I definitely identify as a Francophile, which is, um, I'm not Francophone, but having started French Immersion, you really develop that culture and that identity really, really early on. So it is kind of interesting to have that dual blend where I'm not Francophone, having been uh, raised speaking French, but still very much identifying with that, you know, the culture. Um, my sense of belonging definitely came from uh, one French immersion teacher I had called uh, named Madame Gagné, and she allowed me 
um, to feel safe, but then vulnerable. And I think it was the first time I had to admit as a student, if I didn't understand something and it was such a safe space because I would say I struggled in school. I think I might've had a learning disability without, but working so incredibly hard that I always masked it or made up for it. So learning was never easy for me. So I really, really was very aware of that quite young and where I struggled. So she made it okay to struggle and it was okay not to get it in that space. So that really paved the way for me wanting to become that same teacher. Um, in terms of mastery being kind of in a farming agricultural um, family, it all came through horses um, and training horses and working with my horse. Um, she passed away a few years ago and I definitely feel like that sense of connection is missing in my life because it was, there was, it was just a deep connection and it I don't know. It's hard to explain the bond that um, you can develop with um, one animal. It, it was intuitive to the point where she could, they, they're so intuitive. They read your thoughts. She, we, we just had this connection that is pretty much unparalleled and, you know, losing her was, was quite hard. Um, in terms of ef efficacy, I just answered those questions directly. And for me, it came, came for, you know, standing up for um, one of my kids. Um, it was incredibly, you know, quite painful. And then one thing that I've found is sometimes when you meet resistance or pushback, that creates a lot of self-doubt. Um, you know what? I, when I speak about identity, I feel like I'm very proud to be a first-generation Italian-Canadian. My parents were immigrants at a young age, and I was raised by family and by grandparents because my parents were working two and three jobs. Um, and so being in an Italian family, the sense of belonging, I mean, from you are, you are everybody's child, and at least in the family I grew up in. Um, but at the same time, um, I have two sisters, there's an age gap between us by 12 years, they were a year apart. And then I came much later, we all have the same parents. I just you know, it, I just came later. And um, so I feel also like I grew up with three mothers, which is good and not good. And so um, at times I felt like I had two sisters I could see lead their lives. One was a total rebel, like got in a lot of trouble. And one was really square. And I feel, feel like I'm, I've fallen in between both of them. Interestingly, we're all educators um, and we are the first uh, kids in our family with degrees. One of my sisters um, has her PhD. I'm in the process of getting mine as well. And um, my other sister is a teacher, a grade six teacher. And so I, I celebrate that and, and I look to them, um, I, you know, I look to them as my leaders as well. So um, I didn't really understand my nationality, although I was in a richly Italian family growing up in rich in terms of culture but very much a medium to lower class type of family. My parents just worked, worked, worked. And so I was left at my grandparents' house a lot. And there, I was born in Calgary, Alberta, which is the province over from British Columbia. And it wasn't until I got to high school, which was um, an Italian high school and a flagship high school of the city. And um, when people started to know my name and pronouncing it in an Italian way, Saraceni, I, for the first time, thought, how do they know my uncle and my cousin? So I was brought in at the WAP school, as it was known, and I just felt a greater sense of connection to my family or to my culture because I was engulfed by all of the Italians there and had a rich sense of belonging because of that. But they were strangers to me and good, good friends. So my identity and belonging has always shifted between um, how much I know my own culture and then how, I, how much I was adopted by a culture in the greater city. Um, I think when I think about mastery, I think about a deep moral imperative I have to lean into my value system. And I became a teacher. I became an assistant principal, a vice principal, a principal like I am now. And um, I just, I, I feel like it's my channel to lean into that moral imperative and to stand up for, for those who, who don't have uh, the privilege that I've had. 
And so um, I think the final thing I want to say is it's interesting because I took a job as a principal here at CNB in a different province. And while I should be at the peak of my sense of knowledge, epistemology and all of that, I've never had such little sense of belonging before um, because I feel like I'm new to this community. And I feel like my biggest call to leadership is right now at this school because there's so much happening here and everybody's epistemology sense of knowing and being is so vastly different. And I just don't know, I feel like I have a bit of imposter syndrome right now. Not really sure how to navigate this beautiful crew of people, but there's just no alignment. And so with that, I feel um, that kids are, are not being heard. So I'm trying to help in that way. We are going to have just a minute here before our colleagues come back. And so I'm going to share with you all the kind of debrief questions I was going to ask them as well, which is um, to notice how that felt to share and hear one another's kind of relationships to these ideas. And then just what what are you noticing? Like what was revealed about um, our ways of knowing and being? What's similar? What's different in this little circle here? Uh, if no one else is going to say anything, I'll, I'll just jump in for a second, just to, just to say how different it feels now, just from 20 minutes ago, just hearing the personal story so far, everybody has been mostly just a face on the screen. We got a little bit of teaching background, but hearing this personal background, it's a completely different, um, experience. And it, to me, it just, um, it just underscores the value of the next step with the students that um, getting to know them a little bit better on that level uh, just changes everything. I totally agree, Jennifer, especially with the point, like why it's so important for our students. I feel listening to other stories makes mine feel more like legitimate in some way and how there are so many similarities that like bind us together, but also noticing the differences and like these points that I've been writing down that like bond me to others, but like challenge me to learn more as well. And so how special that we would, will be able to do that with our students that we can do that with our students. I think it's wonderful just listening from, from what I understand, we all seem to have, or most of us seem to have a sense of belonging at school as we were growing up. Um, Correct me if 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 I'm wrong, but that that's kind of lovely to to hear as well. Just like that connection that we we felt uplifted by by these learning communities throughout our life. So um, yeah, I think that could also be a blind spot. I, I've noticed that a lot of times within communities of educators, so many of us were pretty successful in school, yeah. and sometimes that makes it really hard to relate to students who aren't because it's like I. I know how to yes. do this. Yeah, that's so, so true. I, it's yeah, something absolutely. to notice about about you know all of us as a as a group that um, that may be an area where we really can't relate to students, and we have to just be aware of that. Yeah, and we have to be aware of that privilege for sure. Mm -hmm. Listening to y'all today, I'm thinking about how rarely we engage young people in this level of reflection. And how, you know, every day, every school year, they're forming these stories, like they're having these experiences that we just talked about, whatever, 10, 15, 20, 30 years later. And, but they don't often have a space to make meaning around those stories. And I think that's where a lot of the internalized oppression, the kind of, or internalized superiority is the flip side, like, these, it's like an unchecked narrative. If you don't get to make meaning around your experience, you don't get to tell your own story or somebody else is telling it for you, it just starts to like narrow, whether you're in a place of privilege or a place of oppression or both, like it starts to narrow who you are in the world, I feel. So I guess I'm just sitting with this question about like, are we, are we infantilizing kids by not having these kind of conversations with them, right? Are we like taking away some of their voice and their power to like tell their own story. It's a wondering coming up for me today. No, I just want to say that, you know, it's, it's interesting what you just say, Shane, because I, I feel I'm, 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 you know, being a, a math teacher in seventh grade, 
many times I've approached my students saying that it's really worse to learn the math because then they are get empowered and they're gonna have you know uh, they're gonna uh, being able to develop um, um, more as people um, and not only and, and also socially and and many times I realized that it should be the other way around so everything should come up from them not saying okay here is the goal and um, you that are down there jump uh, jump up and try to um, even if I am there to support them but that, that sometimes is really hard I think it's it should be other way, and I, I feel that. I mean, when I I love math, although I used to hate it a lot, but now I, I really really love math, and I try just to convey that uh, feeling that there's something that is sophisticated and at the same time very beautiful, um, and it also provides you with a, a different way of seeing the world. But but that I shouldn't say that they should come explore and and start growing out of that. And it's difficult, it's very difficult. Because I mean, we have a curriculum, we have a long, you know, many things. And it's not the excuses. I mean, it's just that it's, it's hard. This is kind of like a puzzle and put the whole thing together. It's really, very, it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing. I see a lot of smiles from the people just joining us, yay. Um, so we were just doing some debriefing, but my understanding from Jamila is that you just finished your last person. Yeah. So let's just take just a moment. Oh, there's a couple more people coming in and we'll use the chat because of time um, to share from the new group or my group any reflections on how that process felt um, or what was revealed to you through it. If you could. Felt emotional for Jessica. Yeah, we had some emotion in our room as well. And I said in the in our group that that's all welcome. You don't ever have to apologize for that. It's all part of this process. A couple of people felt like it was emotional. Anyone else? How did it feel, or what what kind of insight did you gain from thinking about your own ways of knowing and being? Inspiring. Nice. Well, I'm going to keep my eye on that chat, so feel free to keep weighing in and just close it with um, a quote that Jamila and I love and, and often go back to. Um, and it's connected to this idea that street data is rooted in story and ultimately that stories are a path to connection for us, right? And that there's really a crisis of alienation, not just in our schools, but in a lot of our communities and our societies writ large. So this idea that the shortest distance between any two people is a story. And if we can create space for that, um, we really can start to transform our collective ways of being together, right? Just with a little bit of space in staff meetings and lesson plans and all the places where time is currency, um, we can change patterns and we can change relational dynamics just by creating space. So with that in mind, we're going to sort of shift away from storytelling and reflection on ourselves to thinking about what does this mean for the process of street data gathering. And I want to just do a very light touch on the equity transformation cycle and then Jamila is going to kind of home in on the listen part of it, which is what we're going to ask you to do between now and the next session. Um, so for folks who've read chapter four, this should look familiar. The cycle is, you know, this this process process tool that you're going to be playing with for the next couple of months. And every um, each phase of the cycle is rooted in a mindset, right? So the listening phase, which is what we're working on for the next couple of weeks, is is rooted in this idea that we listen with a mindset of radical inclusion. Jamila will define that a little bit later. Um, but really important that we're not just sort of like equal opportunity listeners. We're trying to listen at the margins. We're trying to center voices and stories and narratives and experiences of those who've been kind of relegated outside the space of voice. Um, and that then we're going to, in our next session together, really work collaboratively around the uncover phase. And in the uncover phase is where we're putting all the street data we gathered out on the table, if you will, 
or the Zoom screen, and we're getting curious about it. We're slowing ourselves down to ask questions, to un fold and unravel the layers of meaning there to kind of listen and study for themes and patterns that are maybe more um, nuanced than we might normally right jamila talks in chapter two about boomeranging back a lot of times it's like we'll get the data and then we're just like okay that means we need more intervention or we need like to add a reading class or whatever we kind of go back to a lot of the same ways of being that we've that we've become accustomed to so we're going to try to slow it down look at your street data get really really curious so that then um, we get to the space of reimagining. And reimagining is about creativity. It's about really thinking outside the box, if you will, but it's also about sharing power. And you might recall from white supremacy culture, one of the characteristics is power hoarding, right? So there's this tendency to write, to try to like collect and guard my power as a teacher or my power as a leader, or my power as a facilitator, whatever our role is, we kind of hold tight to the, to the positional power and authority around it. And when we reimagine in the framework, we're actually building a new kind of design table with the people we've listened to. So in the book, we talk about the example of kindergartners. If we did listening sessions with our wiggly kindergartners, those who are not sitting still or like getting in trouble for moving a lot, we're trying to understand what's happening for them. What do they need to shift about pedagogy and instruction? And then we're doing a design session with those kids. Yes, even the five and six year olds, right? Um, and thinking about what do we need to change? What could we try? And we do this with this really like liberating spirit of action, experimentation and creativity. Um, and so we'll get there. We're not gonna be there tonight, but we wanted to preview all of it. And then ultimately we try something and we get really courageous and we move it knowing that it might totally bomb <laughs> and that that's okay, that that's part of the process, right? We're actually gonna do it with a safe to fail mindset. It might be great, it might not work, or maybe a piece of it will work really well and that's the piece we'll amplify. And maybe the other part of it, we're like, yeah, that was, I'm glad we tried it, but we're not gonna do that again. So that's kind of the orientation is safe to fail, safe to learn, and it takes a lot of courage, which we'll talk about when we get closer. Um, four to six week cycles, safe to fail, I already mentioned. So, you know, the idea here is it would probably be more like seven or eight weeks the way that we do it together, but that it's not meant to be like a year long inquiry. It's meant to be something that you can identify in your classroom or at the school level um, that is that is changeable, that you can actually gather data on and change within a fairly short window of time. And I don't know why, you know, I always come back probably because it was so relevant in my own family to this idea of like the bathrooms, the gender neutral bathrooms at my kids' high school. It was just a total disaster. It was so oppressive for non-binary and transgender students. And I kept thinking like if people were using the cycle, like they could actually really listen to the kids who are experiencing this every day, understand what's happening and why it's so oppressive and why it creates the opposite of belonging and then make some changes, right, that the students are recommending. So that's like one example of a policy level thing that you could change. Okay, that was pretty fast, but, um, you know, there's a lot in the chapter. I encourage you guys, if you have time as a site team, to really do a text-based discussion of chapter four to dig in and talk about, well, this passage resonated with me, or this one didn't, or I have questions about this. Definitely reach out to us in between with questions. And keep in mind that this is going to be like a messy process. It's not gonna be super neat and tidy. It's not gonna be like this linear, we set a goal and then we reach the goal, we get a 5% gain on X, Y, or Z. It's not like that. <laughs> you gotta let go of all of that. Um, it's gonna be fluid. You might do some listening, get to the uncover, and then realize from your street data, oh, we need to do more listening with these other kids, right? Or you might get to the reimagine and be like, oh crap, we need to have some other people at this table. You know, we actually need the parents in the mix with us because we can't quite figure it out just with the young people. So we want you to feel that like fluidity and that like opportunity to be emergent. Emergence simply means that we can't predict what's going to come of this, which is terrifying and exciting. I hope it's exciting. Um, it's not, it's not predictable, right? It's not linear. And we're gonna focus on transforming. Maybe the, the zone of transformation is really small. Um, maybe it's bigger depending on where you sit, but we're, we're not looking to like make an incremental change. We're looking to kind of really shake things up and really change something that's not working. And that's kind of the underlying principles of the cycle. 
With that in mind, I'm going to invite Jamila, if you would, to do a little bit of instruction around the listen phase, and then we're going to push you guys into your team breakout rooms to kind of think about what comes next. All right. So for our folks who are planners, now you kind of know where we're going in this cycle. And today is all about listen. And as Shane was talking, I'm so excited because I'm doing this with another team and they are seeing like amazing impact. So trust the process. Listening. Um, it starts, this is the uh, first part of gathering street data. And so I think it's just important to just define street data really quickly because when we engage in the um, listen phase, we're going to be really focused on doing this. Gathering street data is the qualitative data that emerges at eye level and on higher frequencies when we train our brains to discern it. You will be orienting yourself to high frequency data. When you were just sharing in your groups around epistemology maps, you just gathered so much data that you could spend time uncovering. Um, if we had the time to do it, that's what you're going to do um, with students at your school. It's really data that's always been there, but you have to train your eye and your brain and your heart and your mind to really hear it. And for us, as you all think about the equity challenges you've brought here, it needs or we need to orient ourselves not to just listen to everybody, which would be nice to do, but we really need to shift and focus on folks we haven't listened to before. And that would be students at the margin. So Shane, if you go to the next slide, what we're going to ask you to do when you go into the listening phase is to choose the students who are at the margins. And when you all did your applications, you kind of identified some of the kids who are at the margins in your schools and classrooms. I know for Horace Mann, students who are bilingual or emergent bilingual students were a big part of this for you all. So I just simply ask you all to consider who's at the margins of your school or system. Um, we're gonna have you, when you get to listening, really center their experiences and voices throughout the rest of this process. And we're gonna ask you to think about how you would listen to those groups of people um, deeply. And the reason, again, we had you do the epistemology activity is because that is an example of doing that, really listening to folks and holding space for them without judgment and just a lot of openness. You choose the margins. And when you choose the margins, you have a mindset of radical inclusion, really thinking about how this group of people um, has not been included and how I can include them um, as I'm going through this change process. And so we love this quote from Dr. Christine Ortiz Guzman, who says, the intention, the intentional act of interrupting inequity is where it lives. This is an intentional act of rejecting exclusion, bringing in inclusion. Um, and it's recognizing the multi multiplicity, multiplicity, multiplicity of stories, truths, uh, their proximities, um, their, inter their intersections and the people who own the stories are requisites for equity design work. How I simplify that for myself is that there is so much richness in folks' identity and story, and we have to acknowledge and honor that if we're going to do real equity work. So that's how I interpret that. And so when we think about a mindset of radical inclusion, you're really coming to this with humility and openness to honor someone else's story, not your own. And so with that in mind, we wanna show you an example of what this could look like. You all, um, both groups have different questions you're exploring. We're gonna give you an example of us focusing on a que uh, question with a student that actually was related in some ways to engagement. Um, and you're gonna see us ask the student a question and kind of what we want you to do is kind of watch both, sorry, listen to what she says and what stands out and also what she's telling you without even verbal cues, what she's just telling us with her body. Want to share the clip? There we go. Now that you're in school, because you were out of school kind of on your own, what's your favorite way to learn? And I, I mean, like, do you like to sit? Do you like to stand? Do you like to be on your own? Do you like to like move around? Do you like to have, what's your favorite way to learn? So I, 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 uh, I kind of struggle with that, and so in online learning, uh, it was kind of funny. You could see the 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 kids. They were like they got out of their chairs and they were kind of doing this. And one of the kids were even doing jumping jacks. And uh, my teacher was like, all of the kids, they they spend their time in different ways, and it helps them get through the day. And in and, and, um, 
what's it called? Did I really say brother? Oh yeah, in the classroom, in the real life classroom, uh, uh, it's kind of stressful because like you can't really get out of your chair and start doing jumping jacks and stuff because mm -hmm. I, I mean, I don't know why, but I feel like everybody would be like, why are you doing jumping jacks in class mm -hmm. and stuff? And, uh, well, I do tap my feet against the floor and like, Sometimes I write in my journal because I'm bored and uh, it, it kind of gets me through the, day, through the day. Like if I don't tap my feet against the floor, I, I kind of get stressed. And if I get really, really stressed, I just go to the bathroom and I just sit on the toilet. <laughs> so you can kind of be away for a while? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you were saying kids did jumping jacks and they did all these things to move around. I mean, could we bring that into class? I mean, sure, but it's not really normal. Like, I feel like learning, like it'd be like going to an extra gym. Well, oh, I I feel I feel like I know why. We in our class we don't really have activities. Like we have art, we have gym, we have science. We don't really have like what are those other two activities? No, no, those are like subjects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like gym, gym is gym is a lot of the days, but like we're not really active inside of the classroom, and um, and our recess isn't that long. So just in one minute. What words and phrases stood out to you from that? Um, or you could share what touched and moved you, but really curious what words and phrases stood out to you. It's not normal. Yeah, move, not normal. You can't really get up and do jumping jacks in the middle of class. Escaping to the bathroom. Bored, yes. So I know other folks are gonna um, chime in, but just imagine what we could do with that information. If we really sat with it and really uncovered what this child is saying, I, we could do so much with just what you have in the comments now, right? So what we wanna orient you all to doing now is figuring out who you want to listen to, giving your equity challenges, how you wanna do so. And then we're gonna give you like a little bit of time to just plan that out. And so in the chat, you see um, Shane just put a note taker in there. And what we want you to do in the session right now is just go back to your Jamboard. You're gonna see it linked. And you all came up with those student-centered inquiry questions. Remember that? You're gonna choose one to two you wanna focus on in this process. You're gonna identify a group of kids you want to listen to. Um, you're gonna think about how you might do that. And that's like listening sessions, focus groups, whatever feels right. And when this team is gonna come back together to just get a um, plan going. I do want you to know just ahead of time that by the time we come back together, we want you to have done your listening sessions with kids and we want you to be able to upload your videos so that we can do the uncover process together. So that is something I want you to know. Um, but other than that, I think the time right now is to just go back to those questions, say, all right, what are the one to two given our equity challenge? We wanna focus on the process. Who, how are we gonna do it?